what a great conference this has been. I've learned so much, and I feel quite honored to be here. Um, I'm going to point out two things. Thank you. Yes, I have a slideshow, yes. Um, one of which is visual thinking, and the other one is a quick review of our project that we're doing, our projects, I should put, uh, that we're doing at George Mason. Visual thinking, I think, is very important, and Eli pointed out an uh, aspect of that. So, why don't you take a look at this for 10 seconds? What do you see? Do you see anything there? Do you see this? You saw that. Some people are very visual. That, that. So Dalmatian is there. The question is, do you see it? And will that memory stick with you? I submit that probably many of our lessons we've learned in life are visual messages, and they stick. I am, by the way, a recovering TV weather forecaster. I was a weather caster for 40 years, and so if I turn to this map and start giving you a forecast, someone rush up and say, it's okay, Joe, you, you don't need to do that, stop. But I am uh, coming out back as a scientist after a, a long, long time not being a scientist. Two messages, TV forecasters can be very helpful in our outreach and education. And visuals, I think, have not been given the emphasis they could have in learning. I uh, start out as a scientist, as a uh, summer research assistant, 1963, South Cascade Glacier. And I look at that glacier these days and I start crying. It's really seen a change. And dark snow, yes, we had a version of dark snow in 1961 for about three months in the Cascades. We were spreading coal dust on the snow on a small little glacier thinking that if we could speed up the melt, we could get more water for the farmers in eastern Washington. A small little one summer experiment. I spent some time on Ice Island T3, so I really did start out in the sciences, which was great fun, and then I got diverted. It was an economic decision, and um, started in 1971, lasted till about 2011, and um, yes, I, I did the pilot for the Weather Channel way back in 1981, and John Coleman was trying to convince advertisers, here's what it's going to look like. So he put together a video. Uh, spent some time at NBC with NBC News at Sunrise. Did a little, little work and fill in work on the Today Show. Know most of the cast of characters. Um, did one, or I did more than one, but this is one climate story we did, and I took back to New York. It was the conference of 100 TV weather forecasters. We're all standing outside, waiting to go in, have our ID cleared. It starts to rain. 100 weather forecasters, only two umbrellas. <laughs> and you trust those people? Are you kidding me? Anyway, um, a couple of eureka science moments for me was the IPCC report as it was covered on TV. It was all about far and away in time and space, and I decided then that I, as a longtime local TV weather forecaster ought to be able to help remedy that. My discovery at Ed Maybach Center for Climate Change Communication was a real eureka moment. And then joining NASA two years ago to help their science outreach to TV weather forecasters. TV forecasters are trusted sources of information. Not as trusted as you are, but they are up there. They're about 60%. But they have daily contact with the public. Once again, going back to the NSF uh, two-year report, where do people get their science news? They probably first get it from TV, but you see the internet is quickly making inroads. The great thing about the internet is that TV meteorologists are also on the internet with their websites, and as we heard, with their blogs. And of course we have on the internet these days, with our iPhones and our iPads, continue connection. There's going to be a new study in about 50 years where, why are humans always going around like this, you know? Da, 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 da. But those are great short-term little messages. So we've done a number of projects at George Mason Center for Climate Change. Sorry. Um, but I just want to talk about one, and that was a survey of our forecasters. And basically, 
we asked them a number of questions, but do forecasters believe that humans are causing climate change? You could ask, is the glass full, half empty, or half full here? 53% of our forecasters indicate that, yes, humans play some sort of role. Well, I submit we have, out of 1,300 TV forecasters across the country, that leaves us with a possibility of 700 climate change communicators, many of whom visit schools, give civic talks. Survey says that about 15% of their time is spent talking to the public outside of the TV studio. We also asked them, what are your obstacles to doing science stories on the air? Don't have time to be a reporter, a producer, don't have the graphics, and I can't get airtime. Our proposal is, because of broadband, we can deliver climate stories, climate visuals, to the TV forecasters and do away with many of those barriers. Not 100%, but just by delivering them stories, visualizations, we can help them a great deal. They don't have time. Do you have extra time in your day to do something else? No, we all are over-programmed. So we put together with uh, Climate Central, Okay, let's see if we can, there we go. We might not have sound here. We put together 12 short one minute story climate lessons, climate education for Jim Gandy in Columbia, South Carolina, aired over a year's time. And we found some positive results. 30 seconds you ask, are you kidding me? Or a minute? Can they get enough information that way? Well, that's what the commercial world is based on, right? 30-second commercials. They pay a lot of money to produce those things, and they keep doing it and doing it. So it's simple messages repeated often by trusted sources, whether it's a commercial or whether it is a story about climate. It's the power of repetition, and as we've seen with 30-second commercials, I still do, fortunately, 10-second billboards for the Today Show. Today's weather is brought to you by XYZ. And it's just repetition of the brand name. In our case, it's repetition about science is real, it's here, it's now, there is consensus, it's bad, we can do something about it. We had some positive reports from our first project. Strongest support was self-reported exposure to climate matters was positively associated with beliefs of climate change. Jim Gandy continues to do these um, stories for us. We now have a new project. This is going to run six months just for the state of Virginia. It runs this spring and this summer. Thank you. Yes, right. So we have three test markets, Washington, Roanoke, and Richmond, three or four control markets. One message every week. Hopefully the broadcaster will find time to put it on the air. Most of them will put it on their blog. It's already started. We've already pre, or we've already interviewed for surveys 2,000 viewers of Virginia about their climate awareness. A third thing we're doing, we're doing workshops with the help of Bud Ward as organizer with TV forecasters in various states, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Florida, Texas. University of Texas carried out one on their own. Thomas Davis is working up in New England to do the same. Penn State held one. Michael Mann helped out on that one. We had uh, one with 90 TV more forecasters in Oregon. And coming up next week, we will have a workshop down with 50 TV forecasters. These are all-day workshops. You can see Bud brings in the top climate scientists from around the world, or I should say around the U.S. primarily. But look at this. A lot of open circles there. We could use your help, whether you're associated with a university or an academic group. There are lots of places that we would love to help you have an all-day workshop with the forecasters in your state or your area about what is the climate science. And it's a two-way dialogue. They're together for a whole day asking questions. Just a reminder, visualization. So visualization is playing a huge role in what we're doing now at Goddard, as many of you know and have seen already. For instance, when the report came out about the record low of the sea ice, Goddard put together this animation based on real data. This is a slightly 
altered version because at a particular time I was looking at ice flow um, coming out of the Arctic along the eastern side. But the visual, visualizations are playing a huge role. And I, I posit that if you Google global warming and go to the, the popular websites, you're going to see a lot of text. Text, 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 text. More text, more text. Where are the simple visuals? And I know that many of those 500 education sites have some wonderful visualizations. We need to work more, I think, as a community on short, clear visualizations, as we heard also uh, two days ago. So Goddard is uh, the visualization center, but JPL is the website for, or home for our website for global clim climate change. And they specifically developed a page for TV weather forecasters. Broadcast ready, broadcast can go there, cut and paste. Now we just have some of the basic visualizations, but they're ready to go and they are designed with Fahrenheit, and easy to read numbers. What are we doing now with graphics? What's the message of this graphic? Is this about global warming or is this about the sun? How about this one? Does this really describe the greenhouse and we have a very thin, very precious atmosphere that is essentially sending down twice the heat that the sun is at the surface of the earth? I don't think so. I think we can do a lot better. Lots of theories. You can go to, for those who want to look at some of that afterwards, you're welcome to do that. We can nail them down. This is one particular one about news learning model. And basically, two things come to mind. Can you get their attention? This is just TV now. We're talking about getting their attention. What do some of the pros do? Let's look at what Jeffrey did. He builds a sequence. Easy to follow visualizations. A, B, C. TV is not nature. TV is not science magazine. TV is not your journal. We need visualizations in three categories. The hard slope, the easy slope, and the most difficult. People don't go there if it's too much physical effort. People don't go to our graphics if it's too much mental effort. We are all, in many ways, cognitive misers. Let's take a look at this graph. Let's take a look at this graph. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. Okay, watts per square meter, degrees F. So this is a graph that was used 2010. I was in the audience, and I would ask you, members of the House of Representatives are in which community here? <laughs> would they understand that? I don't know. And I think perhaps even more important than having the House members understand your graphics is there are media folks who are looking for visualizations of what you're testifying about in front of Congress. Let's take a look at this one. We're looking at temperature versus solar activity. Solar activity about the sun is in blue. We don't usually associate that color. Um, I posit that we're adding confusion. We're asking people to turn their head sideways. Um, energy per square foot. What about F instead of C? What about colors? If we're talking about the sun, we can easily put an icon there. I know right away it's about the sun, and I know right away it's about temperature. And so we just need more versions of visuals, and they're not complicated. We need just make them smarter visuals. Some homework for you. Some of you were at the Sackler um, locum. I highly recommend. Most of these are about 20 minutes long, and there's some excellent ones there. So opportunities for you as individuals, you as members of science groups. You can help TV forecasters in your area, in your state, by organizing some workshops. We'd be glad to help you. Befriend your local meteorologist. They're all way too busy, and so, but you probably have a dozen in your market the morning person, the e evening person, the weekend person, out of that dozen, there's probably one or two who would really appreciate some assistance about climate change. The challenge, of course, is to find out which one that is. And as authors, think about a simple 100-word summary with the basic who, what, when, where, why, how. Let's help the media. We're giving press releases that are 
a full page long with all the shades of gray that we like and we know we have to talk about, but journalists don't have time to go through all those shades of gray. And a local television, if you look at your watch during a science uh, segment, you see usually it's just a headline. Here's the news from Science Today. X plus Y equals Z. But the great thing is now we can say, hey, for more details, go to the nasa.gov website or go to agu.org website and think about simple visualizations. The old saying, of course, is a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think that's true. And you probably will look at this now and instantly see that there's a Dalmatian there. And I posit that our visual memory is very quick and holds transfers from that short-term memory to long-term very easily. So I think we can use visualizations to help us out in our communication. And I invite you to help us out. Thank you very much.